Welcome to the Magical Woman YouTube subscribers and to our new viewers. I'm your host, Connie Boyd, and this is the second sequel talk with Jen Kramer. For the viewers at home that aren't familiar with your work and your story, could you just tell them a little bit about your history, you know, how you got involved in magic? Absolutely. So I started magic when I was 10 years old, and my uncle Steve gave me a book for my 10th birthday called The Royal Road to Card Magic. Um, any magician viewers, you'll be familiar with it. It's a classic of card magic from the 1940s. And actually, this is kind of a, a nice thing about recording this interview from home, is that I can show you all the very book. It's right here on my bookshelf. Fabulous. So here it is. Oh. The Royal Road to Card Magic. It has a little inscription from my uncle, which he wrote to me when I was 10 years old, right in there. Wonderful. And that is this book. This is what started it all for me. How it all began. And then I just started performing anywhere and everywhere I could from okay. that point on. So, so you had no problem uh, following the instructions, uh, learning the skills, and taking it to performance level. Well, I do remember spending hours and hours sitting on the floor of my childhood bedroom. I remember I would just sit there cross-legged. I'd have my knee holding this book open, this very book. Yeah. And the passages, it's, it's a pretty old school book and the passages can be rather dense. And so I remember, it's a wonderful book. I absolutely love it. But I remember sometimes you'd read the same passage. I'm 10 years old, you'd read it again and again, trying to get all the little details of you know, hold the deck of cards in this particular grip with your third finger at a 47 degree angle. And you'd, you'd just kind of try and trial and error, kind of work it out. So it, it, uh, it was challenging, but I think I really enjoyed the challenge and enjoyed the process of figuring it out and learning and constantly uh, discovering new things about magic. So this, uh, this book still is very special to me. Yeah, well, you're, you're very young, but even in your lifetime, um, learning methods have changed because now younger magicians can go online to YouTube, uh, uh, DVD, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they have access to it almost at their fingertips, but um, right. you would have had to physically read and try to interpret, and it, so in one aspect, it might have been an interpretation of what you were reading, and perhaps that allowed you to have a performance style that might be different than, than people today that are actually copying what they see on, on video or on, on YouTube or on a, you know, one of our social media platforms. Right. I mean, it's such an interesting conversation because nowadays, just like you said, there are so many resources, so many more online resources than were available when we were first starting in magic. And I think on the one hand, that is so exciting. I think it's fantastic. There are terrific online resources and, and magic shops and magic communities and forums and ways to connect with people virtually. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, on the flip side though, I am such a book lover. Uh, I always have been since I was a kid. And like you said, I think when you read a book, there, there is room for interpretation mm -hmm. and you can sort of, uh, you, might even, you might even misread something. You might even read something thinking it, it's communicating one idea and then realize, oh, you actually put your own twist on it because you interpreted it in one particular way or, or you know, because you don't actually see the person performing, it sort of enables you to fill in the blanks and add your own performance style and really make it your own. So I can see the benefits of both and, and I use both online resources and books. Now don't forget to comment, to hit the like button, to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Magical Women exists for you, and we strive to provide information about magical entertainment with some of the best, most recognized, innovative women in magic in 2020. How important is using your individual skill set and, and, and your comfort zone when you're creating new, new pieces, when you're, you're developing new material? Sure. I think it's really important. I think uh, when, when I'm developing new material, I think about what's the audience going to experience uh -huh. and what kind of a roller coaster journey can we take them on throughout the show and how can we really genuinely be connecting with the audience? And so I think incorporating your individual skills, variety, whatever your individual skills may be, I think that just adds another element. It kind of makes the show more dynamic. It adds another dimension. and 
I think that's, that's wonderful because from the audience's point of view, to really add elements that make the show more you and feel more real and more like this is something that, that just you are sharing with them and it's a special moment, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that is, is something so valuable and so important. Well, I think I, having watched you perform, I think that's one of the uh, facets that um, uh, endears you to the audience because you care about them and you want them to react. You, you care about their experience and that, that caring, giving uh, nature comes across and, and, and it's a likability factor. So you can take greater risks because they like you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Kati. That <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I really do enjoy performing and, and, you know, I feel the same way when, when I've watched things that you've done. I think, you know, you can tell that your, your love of the art really shines through your love of magic and you're, you're uh, really enjoying being there in the moment with the audience. And I think that they can sense that. And I, I hope that when I'm performing that they can sense that too, that I am genuinely just really loving the experience of, of being with them. Now, here's a tricky question. Do you think that being a woman, that you're more uh, sensitive or in tune to your audience in, in, in that interaction connection factor? Do you think being a woman actually contributes to that? Or do you think it's just a, a personality character? Oh, that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, I certainly think women, men, that, that anybody can connect really well with an audience. But I think being a, a woman in magic, especially since it's been such a male-dominated field, it does provide a, a different perspective. Uh, and I think, uh, I think everything in magic is, is important and diversity in magic is important. So whether it's diversity of, of race, of age, of gender, I think, you know, just bringing who you are to the table and sharing that with an audience is really valuable. And, uh, and I think if you can just be really present with them and be real and express what matters to you, I think that's what's most important in connecting with them. Excellent. How did you make the leap, and this is not an easy leap, from being an amateur magician to a professional magician? So uh, I started magic when I was 10 years old and began performing uh, at birthday parties, starting with my little sister's birthday parties when I was around 11 years old and my cousin's sweet 16. And then as I moved on to middle school and high school, I did more performing at corporate events and at private parties. And so I performed all through school, middle school, high school, college, with the Yale Magic Society, doing you know private parties and, and also performing at corporate events. And so when I was in college, I think that was the time for me to really figure out how do I take this thing that I love so much and make it a full-time career? How do I make it a reality and, and work out all the practical elements involved in making it a reality? So I took an internship over two summers in college and I interned for Nathan Burton, who at the time was doing his show at the Flamingo. He's now over at Planet Hollywood. And just wanted to learn about the Vegas showbiz world. I wanted to learn what it was all about. I had only been to Vegas briefly for you know conventions for a few days here or there. And so I wanted to spend a more extended period of time here and determine was this the place that I wanted to, to launch my full-time career in magic and ultimately decided that, uh, that it was and that I really love Vegas. I, I still do. I think it's such a, uh, such an exciting place yeah. to be, especially as a, as a performer and as a magician. And so those college years, as I mentioned, were about figuring out kind of the practical elements. And ultimately when I graduated, I uh, had done some work previously to, to line up some performing opportunities in Las Vegas. So I figured when I graduated, this is the time to take that risk. And you know, if, if not now, then when? This is the time to just go for it and do yeah. this do this thing, take this risk to do this thing I care so much about. Right. And uh, I, I haven't looked back. So after I graduated, I moved out here and uh, started performing in a, in a full-time capacity. So, so how did you have an agent? Did you have a manager? How did you secure your room? How, how did you, this is an impressive leap that you made. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I started reaching out to contacts in different properties in Vegas actually from New Haven, Connecticut. So I was in college at the time. And it was really during my junior and senior years that I started more seriously thinking about, okay, you know, how, do I, how do I take this thing I love and just how do I make it work? How do I, uh, how do I support myself doing magic? Uh -huh. uh, and so I started 
you know, cold calling, cold emailing, uh, pitching my idea for a show. And at the time, I, I, I knew that most places would say no, because I think going into it with that expectation mm -hmm. uh, was important. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's so important to, to not be discouraged, because mm -hmm. in my mind, if I just got one yes, then it was a win. Yeah. And yeah. It didn't matter how many places said no, that they didn't have the space or they didn't have the budget or that this was something they had never done before. Because if I just had one place that said yes, uh -huh. then I was on my way. Right. So I approached it with that attitude. Uh, and I think, I think that's important because had I stopped after just reaching out to one or two or even five places, 10 places, uh, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think it, it it would have necessarily worked out uh, in the way that it did. So I think it really just took kind of being proactive and being persistent. Yeah, uh, yeah. perseverance. <laughs> exactly, exactly, perseverance. So I started reaching out and at the time I, I felt that my goal was to get them to sit down in a room with me so that I could face to face talk with them and, and pitch them the idea that I had and how it would benefit them and, and how it would benefit their guests. So I ended up flying out to Vegas during my spring break when I was mm -hmm. in school and meeting with uh, a couple of properties that had uh, uh, expressed interest in, in having a meeting. And one property in particular, the Wyndham Grand Desert Resort, mm -hmm. at that time said, you know what, this isn't something we've done before, but we'll, we'll be open to, to giving it a shot. Let's move forward with it. And I was so excited about that because yeah. Like I expected, most places, for, for whatever reason, they hadn't done it before, they didn't know me, and, and I had to remember, they didn't know me, it wasn't anything to take personally. Um, but most places, yeah, for whatever reason, it didn't work for them, but for this property, it, it ended up being a great fit. And uh, so I performed a, a weekly show at the Wyndham, starting when I, when I moved out to Vegas. And then about a month later, there was another property, that Marriott's Grand Chateau, and I had been in conversations with them but we hadn't kind of sealed the deal on a show yet and once we had a working model going with the Wyndham weekly show and Marriott saw that that was that was working um, at that point that began as another weekly show so I had these two weekly shows and then a bit later a third property uh, came on and we did uh, another weekly show so I had these few weekly shows set up which for the next few years were this a wonderful kind of laboratory and place where I could continually experiment and work on new material and build the show. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just uh, really appreciative of, of those opportunities to do those shows. So you were workshopping this, sh this show and you were, you started small and you just baby steps just kept growing and, and morphing into the show that you're presenting now. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. That's just right. Fabulous. <laughs> Now, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Come on, you can do it. We need subscribers to obtain more privileges with YouTube. So please, please hit that notifications bell. Spread the word and comment. We love to hear from you.